Um, to call to order the Montpelier Roxbury School Board of Directors uh, meeting for October 18th, uh, starting at 634. Um, so first order of business is public comment. Um, and just to remind folks that um, that public comment is for us to hear from the public. Uh, we uh, listen only, we don't respond in real time, but it's uh, a very, very valuable part of our process in terms of getting community input, um, learning about the concerns of uh, community members, uh, and what we do here uh, we take, take very seriously and, and it's part of our, our input process. We also acknowledge that um, it can be uh, sometimes difficult uh, and nerve-wracking to, to talk before the board, especially depending on, on the sensitivity of the circumstance. We really appreciate public comment. Um, and our silence is not representative of a, of a lack of response at all. Uh, I said, do we have any public comment? Uh, anyone in the room? Nope. Uh, anyone online? Looks like we don't have anyone online. Okay. Um, so moving to the consent agenda, uh, also I want to add to the um, agenda a potential letter of support for a, um, I might get this wrong, a community development grant for Roxbury uh, that I believe Rhett and Kristen have put together uh, and Libby I think is sending a separate one on, behalf, one. Have yep. sent one on behalf of the administration. Uh, the purpose is to help with uh, downtown revitalization um, in Roxbury uh, and it could I think go to a variety of potential investments to uh, continue to um, uh, allow Roxbury to be a, a vibrant uh, downtown center and hopefully become even more vibrant um, so add that we can put that in board business uh, and then do the RFPs ever go around I never the I talked with Andrew. The facilities group has gotten them. Okay. Um, and I don't. I think we forgot to include them in the entire packet. So what do we, what do we do about that? Do we need to? Want, do you want to maybe give your recommendation and then yeah, give people a time to review and then we could do like a. Yep. We could even do like a five minute meeting if we need to approve it for the. I would say let's talk about it and then see, if, where, we're see where we're at. Okay. It was perfect. pretty clear to Andrew and I. Okay. So. Okay. I just want to make sure, um, uh, in case the board does not have mm -hmm. um, a comfort level approving mm -hmm. not seeing them, but we can we can talk about that when we get to it. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Do I have a second? A second. Uh, any discussion? I had one question. My notes are coming up slowly. Okay. <coughs> Um, oh, the the draft agenda for the November first meeting. I saw that we had the budget, um, an initial budget, not presentation of the budget, but things like factors to consider. Do we think this would be a good time to open up public comment after our presentation, or is that are we not ready for that? Possibly. Okay. Something possibly to something to think about yeah. the purpose of that is to um, explain to the board and the community how uh, what we know now around the waiting study is drastically influencing our um, budget mm -hmm. so it's it's really to put in so the board's aware of the the enormous pressures that are on our bus budget this year yeah yeah which could generate great public comment afterwards to talk about goals and priorities right yeah so right. <laughs> so i could mm -hmm. see that being appropriate mm -hmm. okay great thanks i had two really quick questions one is the finance committee meeting in this room right before we usually meet in 126 okay yeah, cool right over there um and then i saw um that y'all are holding a um session with students on the 23rd 24th yeah. um so i can't make it um we'll can we give them an opportunity to share some of what they're hearing from their peers in the meeting on the... Yeah, can be part of the goals and priorities. Yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Any more discussion on the consent agenda? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Thanks, Thank Kristen. You, thank Kristen. Yeah. Kristen. <laughs> uh, and we have student presentation. I think this is yeah. your first student presentation. So take it away. Um, well, we just wanted to give everyone an update about the listening session we're having at the high school on the 24th during Soul Block here. And we're just going to invite students to come and talk about what their interests are for how we can use the budget next year. And I think we would find it really helpful if there were some members of the board present to like guide us and use the board language <laughs> and all that stuff. But yeah, and that's it. We are uh, more fun stuff is we have fall harvest celebration tomorrow. Um, it's just this big day where our school gets together as a community and we all eat lunch and dress up and watch students perform. And this year we're focusing on the taking care of our community aspect. So each um, teacher advisory is going to go out and do some community service to help Montpelier with the aftermath of the flood. And we're just really excited and we want to share that with everyone. Now hold on, back up a second. Okay. Yeah. Usually I have a conference during this day, so I've never actually gone. Okay. The conference is next week, so I can go tomorrow, but I have to dress up. <laughs> well, like explain this part of it. Okay. Do, are, are, do you <laughs> have dressing up? Do you have a TA? I don't. Okay. Well, what happens is each TA like picks a theme, and we decorate our tables that we eat lunch at with the themes, and we dress up. So a few years ago, my TA did sleepover, so we dressed up in pajamas to school, and we brought like a popcorn machine, oh my gosh. and it was just fun. And but is you, it a surprise? Yeah. Because then there's a competition. Oh. Yeah. For as which soon as you say that, I say yeah. central office needs to join next yeah. year. Yeah. All right, yeah. good. And <laughs> done. Tomorrow I'll be dressing up as a superintendent. You do have a TA, Lily. You do have a TA. Central office. Excellent. Yeah, no, thank you. And um, I will be out of town next week, but I definitely encourage any board members to come to that. And if you. It's tomorrow. No, the 24th. No, the 24th. The listening session. Oh, the listening the, session. The listening, Sorry, yes. I thought you meant the fall harvest. No, the listening session. Um, Jason, by the way, just texted me and said, you need to wear an owl costume. <laughs> wow, he's falling uh, along. Do, 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 do you have an owl costume? We do have an owl costume. We have an owl costume. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. Go for it. Um, uh, yeah, definitely, Ted, I think, Emma, you're going to. The only thing is if there are more than two you have to be in listen only mode yes. or we have a meeting. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. I think that's general rule of practice for that anyway. Like yes. any information that's yeah. given is not like decision making information. Yeah, exactly. But sometimes it, sometimes it's easy if they ask questions to start yeah. <coughs> having to start to look like a meeting. But yes, I will yeah. be there yes. for sure. And I think a couple other people express some interest. Not sure if it will work with their schedules. Yeah. 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 And you might want to kind of let people know at the beginning because they might be tempted to ask questions or get your your input on things. Okay. Just, you know, we're, I'll make sure we're, we're not here in violation listen. of, yeah. of <laughs> public meeting law yeah. that day. Yes. I'll be in charge. Uh, <laughs> she, she, she should make sure every day. Not just, <laughs> She's just not responsible for it. Right, I'm yeah, not going to be exactly. in charge every day. Usually okay. you're in charge. Or I know. <laughs> um, are they finished? Are you guys finished? Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, brief is brief is brief is never not appreciated. Quality <laughs> uh, over quantity. Yes. Um, well, we're kind of flying through. Uh, famous last words. Board business. <laughs> Same thing. It's like we share a brain sometimes, which is really scary. Um, okay, so we received three our three responses to our RFP for the facilities. They were all excellent um, and so we were in a really good position with the RFPs we received. Um, there was a scoring rubric on our RFP that we put out that Andrew and I went through after having three interviews and checking with references of the three companies. Um, well, more, more companies than that because of partnerships. Um, and in the end, we would recommend to the board that, that we invite 
uh, the firm Truex Collins and Engineering Ventures to join us um, or help lead this facilities work. What I did was I copied their, this, this was one of the main sellers for Truex Collins. They've developed this whole child framework, which they, which runs all their, all their work is run through this and their core values of their work very much mirror Montpelier Roxbury's core values for what we want for students. So this was a big driver. Um, they have a significant amount of educational work across the world and in Vermont. Um, they have a very successful track record with community engagement. Uh, if you're aware of the Winooski School District, Winooski just went through a major bond and renovation of their building. Um, and the community engagement process there, it could be a challenging one because you want to get so many diverse perspectives and languages and things like that. And I talked to the superintendent who worked with Truex in that process and he said they were magnificent um, through that. So they value the, the equitable discussion and have learned ways to increase um, engagement across multiple identities and diversity. Um, so that was a, and they spoke to that specifically in their interview to us. Um, they have excellent references and they have an amazing reputation amongst um, district leaders across Vermont. Uh, they are not new to this scene in any way, shape or form. Um, so anybody I talk to, they're like, you can't go wrong with Truex. Uh, part, they're partnering with Engineering Ventures. So, you know, as if I remind you, our, our RFP is, is a visioning for the future of innovative design for school potentials, as well as flood mitigation potentials and, and that piece, which is more of an engineering um, feat. And Engineering Ventures is actually doing a lot of the work here in Montpelier. They also have done a lot of work with us in general. Andrew knows them well and is quite comfortable with their skill level. We already have a high level of collaboration with Engineering Ventures. Um, and they also have displayed um, success in flood mitigation techniques that they've put in play with Waterbury being their example. Um, so they, after Irene, they were the engineering firm that really worked on Waterbury's center building, maybe? I'm, I'm gonna get that building wrong. But in the latest flood in July, while much of, much of Waterbury had flooding damage, the work that Engineering Ventures did not. It, it came through pretty clearly. So there's some successful um, mitigation efforts that, that we see very near to us. Um, they have the ability with Truex to think very big around um, schools and facilities and potentials for the future and at the same time have this expertise from the engineering ventures firm around the smaller pieces of mitigation, which was attractive um, to Andrew and I. And on our rubric, they scored a perfect score. Um, the other companies had excellent RFPs and have excellent chops. Um, and some that I was really intrigued by, called Jim today just to run some by him today. Um, some that I want to hook our students up with, to, to work with, uh, and in the end, Truex, responded to our RFP and all of the components to the RFP um, with the most experience um, and detail and success. Um, so we would recommend to the board that we go with Truex Collins, um, and I'm happy to take any questions about it as well. And I do have their RFP right here. I just um, forwarded it to Yeah, let me just add kind of one more thing that, that you know, Libby and I discussed, which I think is important is, uh, apparently, Truex Collins, they did the Winooski renovation, um, which also involved a very detailed community process. And all reports are that they did an excellent job of um, creating that process, steering that process, making sure it was uh, really informative and, and people felt heard and involved. Um, and, you know, obviously, Whiskey, Winooski and Montpelier are somewhat different communities, but, um, you yeah, know, I think, I think that... Uh, that skill is something we want as well. Mm -hmm. Libby, what kinds of things will they be looking at when you talk about design for the future? So one of the things in the RFP, and one of the questions that I've, all three people asked, or firms asked in our interview was, how big do you want to go? You know, how pie in the sky? And if this is going to be, we're spending a lot of money on this, on this report and study, and I think one of the things that the board is interested in and should be interested in is 
if we're going to truly think towards the future, are our facilities enough? Um, can we renovate what we have to build what we need if they're not? And are there other possibilities for potential new builds way down the road or, or whatever? But we want to be able to use this report for years to come. Um, we don't want to report for just what we have right now or what we, our needs are right now. And Truex can really think towards that um, through different design for school. Will they also look at the possibility of combining with U32 or doing something with them? So that's that not really their... A, oh, I'm sorry to cut you off. But I was just saying, or is that outside of the scope of what they're going to do? It's outside of the scope of what we asked them to do, mainly because they haven't been hired by Washington Central. Or, or you know, they're... They are a different district, and we are not in charge of that decision. That's a collaborative decision to be made together. Um, I think one thing they can do is they can look at some very basic data to talk about what's the reality of that situation um, and put that inside the report um, because there are some who believe that merger is, is really an easy decision to make. Um, and maybe don't know all the numbers or the data, you know, simple enrollment projections around and simple um, what can each school building in both districts hold in terms of students can and can, makes that very easy choice look much more complex. Um, so I, they can do that level of work for us and, you know, get in the report so we have it from an outside perspective. We have those numbers as they are now today, but their role is not to speak to Washington Central and, and dig into more definitive merger ideas. Right. Yeah, I think since that idea's been thrown around a bit, it will come out. It would be a good idea yep. to do what we can with it and get some sense of whether it's in or out of options. You know, yeah, it will that. definitely come up. Yeah. And Libby, you had spoken with their superintendent and board chair who also said kind of hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. 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 And and Y Central is going through their own, you know, facilities process. Um, and I think they're gonna yeah, you know, figure some things out too. So I I don't think this report is going to be a deep dive on it, but I think it'll give us some information that, you know, when we talk to Wash Central in the spring, when they've gone through their process, I think we'll both be better informed to... to about needs and desires. About needs and, and desires and, and what makes sense. And what might be cool is, does the Washington Central community's vision for future ed education for students mirror Montpelier Roxbury's? But, yeah. you know, because both of us are going through a, a study together. Yeah. Yeah. So that would that's gonna be great. Yeah. Did all three of the RFPs come in with the same roughly bids as far as price goes? And how much was this one? Uh, Truex was the cheapest. Okay. Actually, oh. um, so Truex came in at. Let me give you the exact price. Sixty-two is. Sixty-two thousand is in my head right now, uh -huh. but I don't want to quote something wrong when it's right here in front of me. Um, and the other one came in at 74 and one came in at around 70, 70, 72, I think. Uh-huh. Uh, sorry. Yeah, 62.5. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And not to put the facilities committee on the spot, but, um, you did, I think, have opportunity to maybe peek at these where the board members did not, just any... Any thoughts on your end? Um, I didn't have a ton of time to like read them thoroughly, so I don't know that I'm the right person to, and I wasn't able to attend any of the actual interviews, which we were also invited to do. I'm not sure if Kristen ended up attending either. Um, it was a pretty quick turnaround. Yeah, <laughs> so under, it was, that was yeah. understandable. The timeline was fast. Um, what we did both do, I think, was uh, ask for a couple of questions to be included and the question that I asked to be included was around the community engagement piece. And so I don't know, I don't have any like feedback on how the three firms answered that. But, um, you know, as you remember in, uh, was it two board meetings ago when we talked about it? The RFP? Possibly, yeah. Um, so. Anyway, when we talked about the RFP, I brought up sort of my hesitation around the Roxbury issue and we worked through that and changed some of the language. And, um, but that was sort of where I was coming from, is like, how are they going to hold those conversations in the community? 
Um, so I don't know if you can let us know how they answered that question. Uh, R3 <coughs> answered, um, it was interesting because two of the three uh, respondents are Montpelierites, uh, live here in Montpelier mm -hmm. and have participated in the, in the phenomenal community sessions that mm -hmm. the city has run um, as facilitators, right? So they're very close to that right. um, and are very <laughs> close. One in particular who has probably more knowledge because they have children in our school system, um, <laughs> more knowledge of our district than um, another who lives in Montpelier but doesn't have kids in the system. And so mm -hmm. they know us from a periphery more than anything else. Um, and, and Andrew and I spoke about that. Turex Collins do not live in our district. One of their members lives in Wash Central's district, as a matter of fact, <laughs> but not ours. Mm -hmm. So um, Andrew and I spoke about that around what, there's so many positives I could name with that closeness to our community. And there's also some negatives I can imagine too around groupthink and um, having easy, easy access to social media and being influenced in ways, influenced positively or negatively, or you know, influenced in directions that way. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they all are different, have different skill sets in this, right? So, uh, one of the groups is has a significantly successful track record in lobbying for educational causes uh, to the legislature, um, and spoke spoke about that significantly in their interview, um, and. And, and with lobbying efforts, you have lots of community work that goes with it, right? So there's, there's definitely a skill there. Um, mm -hmm. Another had um, more, had less of the, the really formal community engagement experience. Um, and Truex has both of those pieces, right? So David mm -hmm. Epstein, who's the lead here, is working with the Legislative Committee on School Construction Aid. Um, he's the lead on that. So he's, you know, they've tapped him to do that, which mm -hmm. states a lot about his experience. <coughs> David also has tons of experience in community engagement around these types of projects. Like that has been his career. And then he hands it off to his partner to do more of the business piece of it. Um, I didn't hear that kind of intentionality with the with some of the other mm -hmm. groups okay yeah i don't know if kristen wants to weigh in anymore <laughs> and i was also in your answer is that the timing was tough and with everything else going on there could be right now i'm not on opportunity to really dig deep into the rfps that were kind of a bit confused um and i think I would say I do appreciate your comment was just about, you know, and kind of saying out oh, there's scripted that is kind of coming in with a with a blank slate and um, you know, prevent me the opportunity for bias to come in. I, I don't appreciate that that perspective. Um, you know, I would be interested to take a look at um, the women's circle and specifically the community engagement piece and see when being a complex community with lots of different um, communities with not community to reach and that would require and Strategies, so it would be interesting to, to take a look at that. Um, but um, I, I, yeah, I didn't participate in any of the um, interviews or get to dig in. So. Yeah, just so you know, Kristen, your, know. your connection's a little um, staticky. Can I just saw my video and see that help. It's like you're coming at us from underwater. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask that you Mars. just click on show captions and just see if at least maybe the transcript um, comes through mm -hmm. so that we can follow. I mean, just as just as a troubleshooting a bandit. Yeah, no, I think it, I think it's Kristen's connection. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. Um... Just testing, is this any better? Uh -huh. Oh, it's so much it's better. Like, so much better. Like, okay, yeah. great. I'm going to take my earphones out. <laughs> um, <laughs> essentially, in a nutshell, what I said uh, is I was in Emma's camp. I didn't have the opportunity to dig into the RFPs or attend any of the interviews. Um, I do appreciate mm -hmm. the, the perspective around just, you know, kind of fresh faces and perspectives and eliminating any opportunity for bias. I can definitely see some some benefit, you know, to that. 
Um, and um, it would be, I would be interested to see just Truex's report um, for Winiski and to take a look at like what some of their outreach strategies looked like. I could see Winiski being a complex community to do outreach in and just to think about how that would extend to, <clears throat> um, to our two communities and specifically our desire to see, you know, we're always trying to engage folks that are, are harder to engage or, you know, historically participate, you know, less frequently in our, in our process. Um, so I have nothing to add in terms of interviews and RFP details, but those are just two cents. Thank you. Helpful. Mia? To suppress this question, we should vote in order to approve the hire? Is that right? We have to vote in order to approve Yeah. yeah. Okay. I wasn't just, I wasn't sure if it was just something Libby and Andrew could decide. No, not with this. Yeah. There's, there's action needed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess the question is, are we, um, you know, I think only a couple of us have really had, you know, the time to review it. It sounds like even of those who've had or have had access to review it, I think even those who had access to review it, um, there has maybe not been a universal deep dive. Um, and the rest of us have not seen it. So are we, are we comfortable doing it totally on the recommendation? I mean, I am, I also had the benefit of a, another conversation with Libby, I was able to kind of talk it through. Um, you know, if we punt and take time to review it, we'll probably not want to wait two weeks to give an answer. We'll probably want to do like a 10 minute meeting or something just to give a yay or nay. Mm -hmm. um, does that make sense, Libby? It does. I can say that our decision was drastically influenced by our interviews. Yes. Not to say that the report that all of them put out are, no. um, is, is bad or anything like that, but we were able to dig a little bit deeper into their process that you won't, you don't get by reading their, their proposals. Yeah. I mean, Scott, Scott. Scott. Yeah. Just a question about process. So, um, does it, because we've discussed it in a public meeting, we, it can be just like, we don't need to then come back together and have a public meeting no. with the full no. proposal. A uh, full ROC. No. Mm -hmm. You can make a vote too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems to me we have committees for a reason, right? So, I mean, if they recommend it, I think I trust the people on the committee to make a good recommendation. Emma? Well, right. I think that what we're saying, it wasn't the Facilities and Energy Committee that's making the recommendation. It's Libby and Andrew. So, yeah. uh, which we can still say the same thing about. Yeah. We have Libby and Andrew for a reason, and maybe right. we can trust what they're telling us. Um, do, when are they planning to start? When are we hoping that they'll start the work? Is it like right away? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So our RFP contract, the dates that was listed in the RFP is anticipation of commencement on the 19th. And we had a conversation with Truex around the schedule, and, and the schedule mm -hmm. is tight, right? Okay. This is a tight schedule so that it, if it needs to influence <clears throat> not this year's budget, obviously, but next year's, yeah. it can. So it's a relatively tight timeline um, for the work to happen. So um, I would encourage the board to take a vote tonight. Um, and were, were you and Andrew the only two people interviewing? or was, We were, yeah. Okay. And then using the rubric, like, can you reveal a little bit, like, was Truex just above and beyond? Yeah, sure. According to the rubric? Sure. like. So it was out of 100 points, um, and there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces to be scored on. Um, GBA received 75 points, Truex received 100, and uh, Leonine and their partner received 52.5. Andrew included a 0.5 there. <laughs> that was on me. So, I mean, to me, based on that, it being, you know, such a big spread between the three, I would, I feel like we could probably vote tonight. And they're like the least expensive, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. I mean, a uh, 100. <laughs> yeah, I got a couple questions. Um, mm -hmm. First question is, um, did the RFP originate with the board or originate with the superintendent's office? 
So we, I made the recommendation to the board that we start this process in response to attending the Montpelier City conversations um, where the school and the district were being brought into that conversation and we are a separate entity of the city. So knowing that piece, um, I propose that it would behoove the board to move into a outside consultant to study facilities based on the traumatic events of the su summer. And then okay. the board approved the RFP two meetings ago. Yeah. To put it out there. And the second question is, um, would the cost be FY24 um, the year we're in or next year? The year we're in. Right now, out of fund balance. Okay. Other questions? Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the... Um, Recommendation. Recommendation to go with Truex. I'll move that we approve the recommendation from the administration to hire Truex for this process. Second. Second. Any discussion? I just want to thank, thanks for taking the time to explain that. I feel completely confident with your choice, and I love that they started with the whole child framework. I think that's fantastic. Um, and I'm also really glad that you had options. Oh yeah, we had so. really smart people we were talking to with different skill sets, and it was it was interesting to to go through to do the interview process. Really talented people out there. What's up? Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. We can <coughs> excited to get this moving. Great. And thank you for all the hard work. On <laughs> yeah. Bo go. Um. Now, board indicators, I don't know. Maybe Should we do the letter of support for the Roxbury Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you for reminding me that You're we welcome. added that. Uh, Rhett or Kristen? Um, do you want to, so wait, did you circulate a copy or no? Yes. You did? Okay. It's in our email. Okay, I've, I've not checked email, my board email since mid-afternoon or so. Um, um, there's a... There's been some momentum in Roxbury to improve the state of the village. Um, and there's been some progress. The new park has been well attended. It's very small. It's very sweet. It has a nice um, ping pong table. And, a, and, and the, the materials are just out there in little bins for people to mm -hmm. use as they wish, which is remarkable. Um, I don't know that anything has disappeared as of yet. Um, uh, and there are a lot of folks banding together. There are people um, purchasing property in tandem, in partnerships, to try to protect the property. And um, the revitalization, um, it is the Roxbury Village Revitalization Plan that's looking for municipal planning grant funds. We wrote a letter of support. We described the nature of the relationship with the village and the school. Um, you know, the, the, the town is 40.6 square miles. It's pretty large. It's one, I think it's, it may be the largest geographic town in the state. It's close. It's mountainous, and um, there's not much of a focal point except for um, the little village. And so um, it's going to enhance the experience of the kids that go there. It's gonna enhance, you know, the sense of community in the in the village. Um, and we try to describe some of our thoughts about that and how important it would be to have improvements to the area, improvements to the sidewalks, improvements to drainage, um, you know, Roxbury floods too. It's it's the it's the it's the highest point on the Amtrak railroad, but it still floods. Um, in the state, so it's actually a river. The, the dog flows north, and the third branch flows south. They're right across the road from each other, um, but they're still flooding there. Um, so it's in need of attention, and we wanted to express our um, appreciation for the effort on behalf of the board, and we hope that you all agree. Do we need? Do we need action to send it, or do we just need to bless it? Just for yeah. 
Any, any questions about the letter, Emma? Or is there anyone in, like, has there been any vocal opposition to this type of, like, seeking this type of funding in the community? Not that I'm aware of. <coughs> I know that there are, there are folks, there is, there is a, there is a, <coughs> um, a, a faction of the community that sort of wants to leave things as they are essentially, but I don't know that they're vocally in opposition to um, the revitalization effort. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they conf those two sort of viewpoints are in conflict or not. I know that people are very protective of their private property, um, but I don't know that that is, in, op is you know, in opposition to re revitalizing the village and in our, the infrastructure of the little village. Okay. <coughs> Yeah, thanks for putting this together. Yeah, yeah no, thank you. Uh, in a uh, short time frame, too. Um, um, Mia? I can't tell from reading the letter of support or the email, and I'm just reading them both now, if the grant is for RVS or if it's for something else in it's for, Roxbury. It's for the Roxbury Village Revitalization Plan. Oh, okay. Um, which is a, sort of a committee. Um, does the revitalization plan include doing things through RVS, Roxbury Village School? No. No, more around the school. Got it. Okay. Although I, I'm not sure if the town hall, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the town hall is entirely in, uh, in the ownership of the, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it, is. It, it, it is entirely of the ownership of the board. So, but that's as merged, uh, you know, a set of priorities as you could have because um, <laughs> mm -hmm. our town meetings are they're happening <laughs> yes they are <laughs> fascinating <laughs> just really quickly I so I, I live in that not hopefully um, by grants and so I either write letters of support or ask for letters of support all the time the only thing I've ever seen come of a letter of support is is goodwill um, and so, like, I can't see if there's, uh, or is there any potential downside to providing a letter of support? And if not, then, yeah, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, well, I think it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it's, it's a, yeah, it's a great way to help the town, too. Mm -hmm. the village. Yes, I just want, I want to be clear. I wasn't saying I would, we would, I would expect any of the grant money to go toward RVS. I just was trying to get some clarity because RVS is mentioned a lot in the letter. Just wanted to, to see. There was, um, there was a, um, a template that, that provided instruction for uh -huh. binding the interests of the entity, which would be RVS and the school board um, in the district with the with To the show town. how we're connected yes. and why it would make sense for us to write this letter of support. Right. I'm with you now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah <clears throat> just to add, the, the letter uh, was requested by a member of the Planning Commission, put a lot of work into um, revising our town plan, and within that town plan, I think that was 2020 when it got approved, and within the town plan, um, one of the big goals was to, you know, gain access to more federal and state funding, um, specifically about the revitalization of, you know, the downtown village area. So it's sort of an extension of this big process that the town completed in the last few years. Um, and yeah, the planning commission is the group that's really taking the lead on it, but the money would come through the town. Yep, great. I move to approve this letter of support for the Roxbury Village Revitalization Plan. Second. Uh, any discussion? I don't think we need a motion, but since we have one, we might as well. Go through it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. And thanks again. Um, great work, and hopefully it comes through. Um, and I just thank you to Libby for also issuing a letter on behalf of the district. I know the Planning Commission is going to be happy to get both of these letters. So thank you. Yep, I already have mine. Great. Great. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, board indicators. I don't know, me if you want to start this conversation. I, I had an idea for how we could hold it, yes, which is that we now, we've shared with the board the an, an updated version of um, the 
indicators of success sh and measures of progress of those indicators of success. Libby, do you have it in Word version on your computer, or is it only PDF? I have it in, in Google. In yeah, Google? Google? Yeah. In Google? Okay, it's great. the one that's linked to our agendas. Great. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I was asking is because I was thinking we might have some, like, editing in real time happening during the board meeting. It would be good if we could all see it mm -hmm. um, to be able to wrap our heads around the, the, any language changes. Um, but before we get there, uh, just to give everyone a little bit of like bridge from last meeting to this meeting, um, what we said in the last meeting is we, we had heard feedback from board members. Libby, Jim, and I sat down and you know kind of processed that feedback. And in in that meeting, Libby said, "Oh, I have I'm having sort of like a light bulb moment here, which is that essentially each of our indicators, like we could name a measure of progress." for each of our indicators. So we started, that's what event, that's essentially what we're all looking at here. In the course of doing that, you'll see in the second priority, the um, one around um, safety, belonging, and wellness, we did do a little bit of revising of the indicators of success. There used to be five of them, and we found there was a, some repetition in the different um, bullet points there, and so we've condensed them into the three. <laughs> and while I think what we started out doing was like, are there measures of progress that sort of match each of these indicators of success? As we, what we've landed on, I think, in at least in the first two priorities, is more of a, do we have measures of progress listed here that will give us the, like if we measure, <laughs> use them for, as, their me as the measurement tool that we intend them to be, will they be, Will we be learning if we're making progress in these priorities around our indicators of success? So I wanted to kind of tie it all up with that because while we started out, I think, thinking, oh, let, maybe we could like line up a measure of progress for every indicator of success, I think what we actually ended with was something a little bit more holistic that addresses the full priority and each of the indicators of success within the priority. Um, by having multiple measures of progress. And hopefully that just, that preamble made enough sense to everyone <laughs> sitting around the tables here. And so my suggestion would be that we take each priority one by one and ask that question of ourselves. As they're written right now, will they serve as the tool we intend them to be? And then if the answer is yes, great, we'll move on to the next one. If the answer is no, then what are the ways, What what's the, additional language or changed language that would help us get to that, making them that tool that we need them to be. How does that sound? I think, I think good. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah, Great. I just, I, I was really pleasantly surprised when I opened this up and saw, I, that, I followed that logic. I was like, oh, it's like there's one for each. <laughs> um, and so I, I don't think we need to hash out language, but I, the, I don't think the left column are indicators. Um, I, but again, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's, wor it's, it's necessary to parse out like the, the specific terminology. I just really like the structure. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to start out by saying that. Because I think last time I voiced, like, there were like one or two measures in some cases, and, and, I, and I thought we needed more. I agreed with the statement that you can't have too many, right? And so I like this as a nice balance, so. Great. Great. Can I give a little, like, um, background to the feedback? So I, I sent some feedback via mm -hmm. email for prior to the meeting. Um, and I just, you know, I haven't had a lot of time for board work, <laughs> as I think a lot of us struggle to find the time to, like, really do deep dives uh, on these materials. And so I've been feeling a little like frustrated by my lack of time to um, to attend to you know whether I feel settled in this language or not. And I ended up spending some time today with a friend of mine who's a data analyst by profession, and I, I gave her some of my thoughts, and then she gave me some feedback on you know my thoughts relating to the language, and. Um, and so I do have some suggestions about how to move forward and we can go sort of step by step. But one of the things first was 
that there's sort of some industry standard language and Scott just touched on the big one is indicators. And indicators in the industry of sort of social science research isn't the way that we're using it here or like the things that are in the bullet points aren't necessarily indicators. So my first suggested change <laughs> um, would be maybe to call, um, you know, we have the vision statement that we're gonna, that we have written. So that's the vision statement. And then the, the things in bold in the green are the goals. And then the things below in the bullet points to the left would be called objectives. And then the expected measures of progress are more aligned with industry standard of what indicators are. So that would be one suggestion, the first suggestion that I have. <coughs> Can you say that again? I didn't yeah. follow. So we have a vision statement. It's not on this. Oh, that's wrong. Okay. It's not on this document, but it's on the other document that's listed in our gotcha. agenda. Mm -hmm. So the visions, the vision, it would be like vision and then goals, objectives, indicators. Mm -hmm. Objectives, measures of progress. Is that what you meant? No. So like, so the vision would be listed and then close the academic achievement gap the three things listed in green and bold, close the academic achievement gap, um, sense of belonging, safety, and wellness, and community engagement and accountability would be the goals. Yep. And then the what we now currently have labeled as district indicators right. would be labeled as objectives. Right. And then the things to the right that we now have labeled as expected measures of progress I think it's okay to leave it worded that way, yeah. or we could call them indicators. Oh, I see, okay. We could call them indicators slash measures of progress <laughs> if we want. Okay. Um, but that would make more sense to people who are in the know <laughs> with okay. this type of thing. Sure. Yeah, right on. Glad to have one on the board. <laughs> so, so I'm clear we switch like measures of progress and indicators basically in terms of the terminology. It's just terminology. Yeah, it's just, just a terminology change. We call yeah. this the nope. green objective. No, or we call that goal and this goal. objective. Okay. And we call this indicators. indicators. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we would get rid of the measures of progress entirely? And get rid of, yes, yes. Okay. Or if you want to put it in parentheses, like indicators, parentheses, measures of progress, if people, yeah. you know, I think that might yeah, make sense to more thought. people who are not data analysts. Well, I'm not a data analyst, <laughs> and that, that made me, I couldn't articulate what it was about it, but that. Yeah. Sure. Sets better. <clears throat> Sets better. And then, Emma, did you want to move on to some of the feedback you have for the first goal? Yeah, and I'm happy, like, I don't have to be, <laughs> we, can, we can take turns, one, two, three, before me, if anyone <laughs> else has other, anything else to say. Did uh, other folks have more um, overall feedback? But yeah, that's, pro that's a good idea. Uh, any other overall feedback before we jump into any specific goal? I see Jill and then Scott. My overall feedback is I think we've come a long way and I really like this a lot yes. and it makes sense to me. And that subtle change of the names also makes sense to me as far as like these are the, these are the indicators, right? Like if I have a fever, an indicator would be that I, I took my temperature and it was 99. So like I, I think we've come a really mm -hmm. long way mm -hmm. and I really appreciate it. And this, I really like the sort of the layout and the structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Awesome. Um, I, so our audience is the community ourselves. Um, and so I think, um, as much as we can, um, spell things out. So instead of MTSS, write out multi-tier, mm -hmm. thank mm -hmm. you very much. Mm -hmm. Um, SEL is another one. Mm -hmm. Um, I, Cognia is a thing, so I don't think that you write that way. In any case, wherever possible, I think it makes yeah. sense to, to write, to spell things out. Yep. Let me put an asterisk and I'll put like a, a brief, a jargon, yeah. <laughs> a jargon glossary at the end. Yeah. Cause, Cause I was even then like, it gets really long. So, so yeah. I'll just put an asterisk next to each jargon and, mm -hmm. and or put the, it down below. 
Sorry, I cut you off. Go the ahead. first time you use something, spell it out, and then right. every time after. So it gets pretty long. Yeah. yeah okay. Long. Any other overall? <clears throat> okay, Emma, I think we're ready for you. Okay. Um, so my first recommendation, well, first I had a question about Cognia, if you could explain what Cognia is, and does that include VT cap? And it's the was, same thing. It's the same thing? Yeah. Okay, because I was looking at the VT cap mm. thing and couldn't find Cognia on there. Cognia is the company who does okay. it now, so <laughs> it's the same thing. It's just being called two different things. Okay. Nothing's, nothing's stuck yet. <laughs> oh, so it could be called something different next time? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> um, um, do you think it's, it, the, it's the replacement of us back. Could it be valuable to put Cognia in parentheses VT cap or, or just replace Cog it with Cognia VT slash VT cap just because I think that's what most community members are seeing? Like but when yeah, or it doesn't matter to me. Maybe we just say state and local assessments. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that yeah, yeah. Just when it there changes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was there for kneecap to S back. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That would be fine with me. Yep. So okay. got to state and to. local assessments. Yep. So, so Cognia or whatever it is, is the state, current yes. state yes. assessment. Yes. Okay. Great. It really doesn't. All right. Um, and so the other thing, the, the language that I had emailed ahead of the meeting was about wanting to be sure that we're clear on not just disaggregating data when possible, but that we're actually hoping to see a 5% growth in literacy and a 10% growth in math across demographics right you making sure the language is clear about that right and not just that we see what the data is but that the overall measure of achievement is that it's five percent as a whole but that we would want to see five percent growth in different demographic areas um, and so the language that I sent that I suggested was using state and local assessments we see five percent growth across all demographics in literacy each year through spring 2026 and same for the, the math language. For any demographic, like, there's probably a lot of different ways to slice it. Yes. So like this was a, a conversation that we got into a few meetings ago where it's like, how much time do we spend being sure that we're not like pigeonholing into being able to speak for like every single demographic and a lot of them we can't speak for because of FERPA. Like, right. Um, is there is there like a uh, a standard um, set of demographics that are, you know, reference like, because I mean, um, you know, you there could, are uh, one demographic group. I know this is crazy, but could be like, um, you know, people who don't tie their shoes, right? So right. that's. A demographic Coming group. Coming from the data <laughs> analyst. So, like, what's what's the core group? <laughs> <laughs> Just right. So, I'm open so to suggestion. Um, there, I actually was noticing. I was thinking the same thing, Jake, and um, noticing that in the A23 policy for engagement and vision, there actually is. I mean, I know that we use it over and over again in policy, but there is sort of like a standard um, demographic breakdown of based on race, ethnicity, disability, gender identity, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. So we could use that if that would feel better for you. Yeah, if those are like the six, you know, core groups that data is collected for. The, the challenge, there's a couple challenges in there with um, FERPA, with the N size being too small, and uh, gender identity as a self identity. We yeah. don't have, we don't have formalized data on that. Okay. particularly tied to test scores, nor should we. <laughs> I also think a part of it is like just what is the reasonable interpretation, and I don't think most people would reasonably interpret that we need to report data out on people who don't tie their shoelaces. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do know what you're saying. Um, um, so maybe like, you know, it's, those, it's the five groups just mentioned, and then um, we add like to the extent that um, we're allowed to, you know, look at their uh, data Pub individually publicly, or publicly display data. You know, you, you can't display any data that could be identifiable. So the end size is 11. Right. 
I, I could see that being like a helpful footnote, you know, in that area, you know, as, as, you know, thinking about audience as a uh, caregiver or lay person when they see when possible, you know, while I think we all at this point are aware of like the N less than 11 limitation, um, you know, when possible to a, a caregiver, maybe like, you know, when we've got time for it. So, you know, maybe that's something that we want to just um, either kind of succinctly you know make clear in that statement or a footnote again i know we don't want this to be like an overly complex document but just being clear about that um knowing that we're not going to be the only intended users for this and then were you going to say something i was going to say i, I appreciate that um what you were saying jake um in that you know if the public looks at this they're not going to really know unless we describe exactly what we're talking about. So I think it's just good to be really transparent and clear about it. Yeah, I had a question, just clarification around the, the like when the N is lower than 11. So just because we can't report out doesn't mean we shouldn't be tracking that as a district. Well, we right? are internally. Yeah. We just and can't report it publicly. Yeah, so the board can see those data, we just can't report them out in public? No. We no. are the public. We are, yeah, the problem is when the board meets as a body, mm -hmm. everything we do is in public, unless we have a reason to go to an executive session, and looking at that data is not a reason to go to an executive session. I also, as a board member, wouldn't want to see that level of possibly identifiable information. If it's not allowed to be reported publicly, I wouldn't feel comfortable seeing it. No, again, I guess that I didn't ask the question correctly. The, to me, the important thing is, as a district, we're still collecting that information. Oh, yeah. and, we, and so if I know that there's a demographic group, I don't need to know what the demographic group is. So, you don't need, so I don't need to know what the, like I won't have the information that would indicate who those people were, but, but rather we're being told we're doing great except there's a demographic group in which we, we our literacy our scores are dropping. Right, so that's the piece that's important. Not no, not not that they're not knowing the specific groups, but knowing that there is a group that's lagging is important information. I think in the way you just said that statement, mm -hmm. that is a very viable and feasible statement to make. Okay. I think it might leave the board feeling unsatisfied <laughs> unless <laughs> unless you <laughs> also showed us unless you also showed us disaggregated data, and then there was. A certain demographic you didn't show us, and, and it was you, obvious. Like it could it, be it might, it might end up being like. <clears throat> I, don't know. I also think like the methodology and the way that it's reported out, especially the disaggregated stuff, is going to come down the road, and we don't really need to define that tonight, right? So like I, I mentioned at the last meeting that like most of these groups are probably over eleven, and some of them we're not collecting, right? So it's like, as if you're reporting by district. But if you're looking at like third grade, then maybe you can't report out. Totally. So I think usually we can sort of find some valuable information that can be reported publicly as long as we yeah. bring that, that end size up past 11. And it's also important, I think, just to say that if the end size is below 11 and we're not reporting on it, doesn't automatically mean that the scores are low as well. Right, right, right. right. It's, not, it's not an automatic. Right. Exactly. So I see, I see Jill, you have your hand up. I just wanted to bring us back to right now, what we ha are sort of working on is these two pieces of um, updated mm -hmm. language that Emma has proposed with maybe a um, friendly amendment opposed by Jake that we replace all demographics with listing out at least the five that are sort of like the germane ones to um, testing. Is that where, I just wanted to make sure we're all, I think that's where we're at right that now. That sounds right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jill, what was what's your so if we do um, go with Emma's edit, we wouldn't need this a disaggregated. But I was going to say, in light of our n size conversation, that could we just say as allowable instead of when possible, and maybe that would eliminate the feeling of it being a wishy washy thing. But like as allowable, disaggregated yeah. by. But if we're not going to use that, then that's a new point. The right. other thing is to put the like this disaggregated bullet is listed. What is it only listed the two times? I guess so. It is, and then, but it's wrapped into another one. Yeah. Under so I feel like we could just pull that out as like a an asterisk at the end of the document. 
if we're putting other things as asterisks at the end mm -hmm. of the document, yeah. that could be something that so we're yeah. also putting yeah. down. Or state it right at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the disclosure limits um, are actually sort of not here. They're neither here nor there for this document. Like the fact that we can't disclose information for groups less than 11, you know, that's does that belong in a goals document? No, it, no. I think the reason that we're talking about that, though, is because board members are then thinking like, OK, if this is a goal or a measure of progress we're setting for ourselves, how are we going to know whether or not we're meeting it? So we're, we're already thinking a couple steps ahead to like when the, the administration comes to us and brings us data, we're going to want to know if we're hitting this measure of progress. So I, think it, I don't think we're talking about putting that language in the goal, but it, more just like thinking a couple steps ahead. You're saying you don't think that the bullet that the language under bullet point A, disaggregated when possible by identity and socioeconomic status, needs to be in this document. Is that what you're saying? Right. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, it's like so not just the end size, but that. It's statement. just an just as an expectation that we will yeah. disaggregate when shared with the board. It's been a topic of conversation that has come up enough from public comment and board members that. It's something that we're interested in, in <clears throat> sort of like our equity goals and policy for the district, that I think it actually does make sense to keep that language in, even if it's sort of superfluous. Okay. Just because it will sort of touch on <coughs> the issues that have come up in the past. What are you going to say, Yeah, I, I just like the idea of having a, a little blurb right in between somewhere up there, I don't know, um, above the boxes that just speaks to this and says yeah you know we're trying to you know our general intention which is to be as equitable as possible um and I, I i don't know it's we spend a lot of time on this i think that the the administration is equally focused on closing gaps <laughs> Um, where they exist, and I think if we put it right at the top, it doesn't have to go into each little section, maybe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that makes sense to me, because the way that Emma has worded the two measures of progress, I think, puts that into the measure of project progress itself, and then what we're saying is we will be able to adequately use them as measures of progress when we have data that is presented in a disaggregated way when allowable, but could put that in as like either in the glossary at the bottom or right at the top, meaning it doesn't need to be a sub bullet in the measure of progress itself. How much of the um, language from the other version, the, the vision, vision approaches values, that those top parts, right, the mission and vision approach, are those going to be merged with the work that the um, administrative team put together in this document that we're working on? Or, you know what I mean? Like there's the, a lot of what Rhett, I heard Rhett saying is, is at the top of that uh -huh. vision approach and values draft. Right. Right, so the sections on vision and mission mm -hmm. and approach could go above the table on this document? I was just wondering how, like, if any of the documents <coughs> are going to be combined, because I know that, that Libby, you all like pulled out the pieces yeah. at the bottom to work on, and so I'm just wondering if they're getting going to get merged again. What I would recommend is we hand that to my trusty Anna to make pretty. Yeah. And, and, um, <laughs> and then have a link to it perhaps on that doc, but sh have them both up on the, on the gotcha. school web, or on the yep. district website. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do folks feel about these two updated, the language, updated language for these two measures of progress? The ones that speak to growth within academic, the goal of closing the academic gap. Um, have you, you haven't changed it in real time on the document, right? Would you like? I still have only still, can find I a still, PDF. Click the oh, link if you on the go agenda. Through, go Sorry, through the link, the link that's on the, yeah. the, Thank you. Yeah. on the agenda, and then you'll be That's what I need to do. 
I, th- I was just waiting for some clarity as to which, what wording yeah, word I just thought Mia. landed on. And I was blaming changing. Mia for that. <laughs> I was, Not I was you, it just to be clear. Time. Sorry. I saw what <laughs> she was looking at. <laughs> I'm still catching up. But yes, I, I feel good about it. <clears throat> here, man, here, let me just share it with you real quick. I have thoughts about the fourth one. Um, and so for at that point, I'm happy to, or if we want to finish the third or continue the first two. All right. It's shared. I'm with you now. Thank you. Email. Um, so we would do that. That. Uh, the rest of thing. We see five percent growth across all. I got it. If we want the language yep. Emma suggested across mm-hmm. all demographic areas. Thank you. Yeah. I just wrote across all demographics. Sorry. But I, I mean, I, gr- I agree with what Jake said about it. Mm-hmm. Are, we, are we going to take that into account and list it there or no? Or put it in parentheses? Be somewhere, I think. <laughs> okay. Whether it's up above or just so people know what we're looking at. Or do we change the word all? Like uh, just uh, say across demographics. Demographics of interest or something. Yeah. Would that I'd um, say I just take out the all. Yep. Okay. Does that feel better, Jake? Or do you want to list them out? Um, I think somebody would want to know which demographics you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's only five that we are really able to track and collecting data on. So maybe we would somewhere say what the five are. Gender, race, socioeconomic status. Disability. And what's the fifth one? Ethnicity. Ethnicity. Thank you. Um, I would challenge gender simply because we have the way the state reports gender mm-hmm. is a yes or no, uh, or a, a dichotomy, a two, a two choice. Bi- binary. Binary, uh-huh. thank you. That's the word I was looking for. Uh-huh. Um, and that is not how our student population yeah. or what our community values. However, right. it's what we're forced into from the state. Um, so I would not want to um, inflict any, any, anything on our students who do not fall into one of those two car- mm. categories. Mm. So I would, I would just challenge that. Um, or, or have the board think cl- closely around that data. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wonder that, if we keep it in and then when we're reporting out, we explain the limitations of reporting out, reporting that data out. If I'm non-binary, I feel uncomfortable <laughs> just seeing it. Mm-hmm. I would argue too the value of that breakdown doesn't seem it, yeah. like it would be nearly as helpful as you know the ones that come to mind you know socioeconomic status um, you know they're, they're sort of the big top three and, and if students are um, on an IEP like those are the sort of measures that I think actually provide value I don't see how gender actually is a valuable metric so I don't think we need to that might be the case now, but I can remember when I was in school that there were there were big concerns about like are we ignoring girls in classrooms or are right. we over over um, ascribing aggression to boys? Yep, and and males of lower socioeconomic status are like the worse off. Yes. No, yeah, I, absolutely. I'm just saying so, for the purposes of our goal setting, if that's not a measure or an indicator that we need to see. But, but that's fine. That was one of the reasons why I was interested in gender because that was sort of the big, you know, what one of the things that Libby has said, and you and you did just say recently that it might not be true anymore because we don't have updated data. But in the past, it was pretty reliably um, boys who qualified for free and reduced lunch that were like predictably falling low on state assessments. 
So I feel like there would be a way for us to be delicate around the reporting of that and when we present the data explaining its limitations. Um, so I guess I would sort of advocate for it to be included. Um, I would also be interested to hear what our students have to say if you have any yeah, um, input. I think, I think gender is definitely an important demographic here, but I think seeing it only as the binary of female and male is just such an incomplete and potentially harmful way of looking at it. I don't want to say it would make the data unusable, but I think even when looking at the limitations of that, I mean, it's definitely possible it could have value, but I think it would be very re reduced. I think that mm. would be hard to get much from. I, Sorry. Well, I also feel like, I don't know, yeah, the binary doesn't seem, because I feel like what comes with being like outside of the binary also comes with like mental health and also like personal kind of turmoils that people have to deal with which might also explain certain test scores like if you are concerned about your existence you might not have time to focus and put all your effort into school so I think having more options can also help exp like it can help with analyzing the data as well. I really wish there was a way for us to see the data not in a binary way because I think that would be really useful but this way, you know, like Alara said, and just because, I mean, we have a pretty diverse student population. Mm -hmm. I think it just wouldn't be very accurate. Mm -hmm. right. So, Jake, I'm sorry to say this. For this very reason, I think we should not be listing out those socioeconomic, sorry, the demographic groups in this at this point. Um, we could have the same conversation about race. Race is, is a social construct. It's not a biological construct. Um, Which also has challenges with how the state yeah, requires us exactly. to report right. out. You can't choose yeah. more than yeah. one. Exactly. Thing. Right. Yeah. And right. So you know, it's, I can remember Sagey saying, "I don't know what to choose." Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it, I think it's problematic to have them listed. Mm -hmm. I think as long as we acknowledge that there are important—I don't know what the way to do it is—but there are multiple groups of which we are interested, and and we should track that, and then worry mm -hmm. about what those are. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, I think it could say something like all demographic groups and subgroups, and then we could footnote things if we wanted to. Um, you know, I think all of these variables here, you know, gender, disability, um, race, they're all either binary or, you know, they're bucketed, categorical. discrete yeah. things, they're which are yeah, not yeah. perfect. Um, but as a board, you would be interested if you found out that, like, girls were getting better 10% each year in literacy where boys um, were flatlining, right? Mm -hmm. So like we are interested in that kind of thing, even though yeah. gender is an imperfect variable. So um, I think it's okay to be high level here, um, right. but then when it gets down to like analyzing data, we're gonna have to acknowledge that these things aren't perfect. I mean, the groups of interest might change. You know, it, the, group, the demographic group might be Roxbury students versus the Montpelier students. And so like, I think it's important mm -hmm. to give the board the leeway to, to decide mm -hmm. what groups and what groupings into the future. I'm really interested in the shoelace group. <laughs> I don't mm. have that data, I also guys. think like when we- <laughs> Just wait, um, Panorama can collect that. <laughs> one, of my, one of my questions, one of, a question that's coming up for me, um, we're moving from listing these things here and then talking about them um, differently when we look at the data and I'm and now we're moving towards not listing them here but then asking about them when we're looking at the data and I'm wondering how we ask about like what happens when I ask a question about a group for which there isn't an, isn't an N that allows um, a public answer what do, do, Libby, do you just have to say that I can't our answer? N size, our N size is too small. For me to answer, yeah. yeah. So how do we, how do we discuss, it, are there ways to say, are there, can we ask if there are patterns that are concerning to you, yes or no, and sort of are we 
do you have a plan for addressing them? Yes or no? Stuff like that. Like Absolutely. Yeah. I'll just reiterate that it might be unsatisfactory to the <laughs> right. board and the community. <laughs> but absolutely, we can answer those questions. And I think we now have gotten the language of these two measures of progress in a pretty good spot, so I'm going to move us along. Good job, Facilitator. Yeah, I think we should. I think, I think we should share out the rest of it. In we should resist meetings. going yeah. into method specific methodology and reporting out. Like yeah. in the end, like you know, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. Right. We don't I have to define that tonight. Okay. Yeah, I have one more question. Great. And that is about the percentages. I'm sorry, but. So thinking about uh, all the conversations we've had over the last several months about reading in the district, right? I'm wondering how did the 5% get selected and where does that put us in terms of um, people feeling that the reading is behind or inadequate? So our, since our, we've sent this out to you all, I don't feel like I'm breaking any AOE violations by stating it publicly. Our VCAP literacy scores across the district were at 70% this year, which is quite high um, across the state. We're uh, way above the state's average. So in 2020, if we're talking about percentages of growth each year and we're talking about 2026. That's 85%. Yeah. Is that unrealistic? No. Okay. I don't think so. I don't think so. In, in um, I think I stated in other meetings, the 85% um, came from RTI research, which says that our first instruction and, and really second instruction in terms of tier one and tier two should reach 85% of our students becoming proficient. Um, and it's the tier three, the remediation that should get um, the, the, the next group. So we the board or the the leadership team chose 85 percent specifically um now our math scores were not as high in the in the vcap still higher than the state assessment but not as high um and we have a lot more air room to grow in the math scores lots of more challenges with the math state testing last year than the literacy t state testing so they're how reliable those numbers are is questionable. However, we're much closer to the state's average, a little bit higher than that. Um, and so the leadership team saw opportunity for more potential growth in math than in literacy. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Emma, are well, you moving us along? Kind of. <laughs> um, the letter of support that we voted on tonight for Roxbury, we can do something similar and have done things similar in the past to lobby for changes. And I do feel like this could be something that we could write a letter to lobby uh, VT Cap. Don't know on who the, that person is to send a letter to. On the we gender could question. draft a letter to say, please, you know, it's harmful and for race. you to, to think of gender as binary. And we would like you to include this race. type of scale when asking about gender. Probably um, a much larger topic. However, it's not VT Cap that does that. It's the state reporting in general. How we rep have to report our students to the state for like census data. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, much it's bigger than tied that. to the federal. All right, let's yeah, make a exactly. note. Yeah. We'll it's the federal note. government. It. It's tied we have to, to go all the way up. It's not. It's not a state decision. <laughs> but we could just to feel like we're not doing nothing on that. Like if it's something that is rubbing everyone the wrong way, like maybe we can just write a letter mm -hmm. to somebody. To someone. Maybe yeah. we'll get a letter back. Right. <laughs> Dear Joe. Um. <laughs> we have got a Does minor them, sort please. of grammatical thing. Yeah. Can we change it to, <laughs> um, we see 5% growth in literacy each year across all demographics rather than the way it is now? Yes, each year. Okay. Um, so you got it, man. Yep. Tag team. All right, so then Emma, you have a suggestion for the fourth measure. I have a comment that's related to, to Emma's suggestion. Okay. Um, the, Emma, I, I like that, except, wait, I've got to get back to um, the document. Um, so one thing, I, I don't know the right answer here, but whenever, so I, I'm a quantitative scientist, not a, not a um, qualitative, but self-reporting is like the, the, the tool of last resort. And so um, are there measures that don't involve self-reporting to collect these data would be my first question. And then the second is the, the objective is, our, it speaks to our graduates. 
So it doesn't make sense to me that we'd be collecting data from 8 through 12. We'd want to be collecting data from our, our near graduates and newly graduates, right? If, that's, if, we're, if we're trying to collect information about our objective of our graduates envisioning limited list pass, paths, it just doesn't make sense that we'd be asking eighth graders. I don't know the answer to your first question, mm -hmm. but my opinion on the second one is that it, it would, I think it, I, I think it does make sense because it helps give us a sense of like, how are we doing with someone who's very, who we still have a lot of time with to before they graduate? That's my short answer, short way of responding to mm -hmm. that second point. But I, and I don't know the answer to your first question. I also think that it has come up in discussions in the last however long I've been in these discussions <clears throat> that it's notoriously difficult to get responses from graduates or from people yeah. that are no longer part of the, it's gonna self-select for a specific people to answer with specific experiences. <clears throat> um, just hard to get that information. Absolutely, and that's why I, I, I see where Emma was going. I think you said 11th and 12th graders. You know, get a, as they're leaving, like an exit interview, like how do you feel you're graduating? Do you envision a, limit, a limitless past? And, and I think we could have both these things. I, could, I think we could leave the one that's already there mm. and add the one that Emma is suggesting because it gives us then the data that, for, that we can work with while we still have students for several more years, mm -hmm. and it gives us, a little bit more of targeted data to tell us how we're doing on this, that particular piece. As a quantitative person, um, self-reporting confidence is unclear to me. Like, what does that mean? You know, do all of them self-report confidence, or you know, are you saying um, that most of them do, or what is it? So I would say that the quantitative measure would be academics, which we have, right? There's a quant that would be the only quantitative yeah. measure I can think of off, off the top of my head um, in terms of that. And I don't know if that necessarily paints an entire picture. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it paints one picture, but I don't know if it paints all the pictures that we're interested in. Um, which is why we talked about adding something around this piece. Um, I, I think that students rating their own levels of confidence in their abilities to take on the world, if you will, in whichever choice they desire, I think that actually has, I'm incredibly interested in that. If our school system and our community and our, like we all did that together for our graduates. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I, I think I personally think it, we'd have a lot. We'd get a lot of value on that. And I agree with what Mia said. I think we probably had this conversation because I agree with what you said around um, we've got a lot of time with an eighth grader, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, if we're just asking 12th graders, it's kind of like, whoops, not so much, you know. <laughs> and there's another piece later on, I believe, around using specifically 12th graders, didn't we put something around 12th graders for um, their plans for the future? It was in an old version. Oh, okay, okay, okay. sorry. Several meetings ago. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. And but I yeah, was that was something we considered. Mm -hmm. okay. So I should know this answer because I think I was a part of the small group that originally came up with the language here. But I, if, if our goal is what you were saying, Mia, then I think it should be our students envision a limitless path not our graduates. Because if, if we're interested in our eighth graders and whether or not we can impact them over the course of the next th four years, then, yeah. So I, I, would, I would say then our goal, our objective is our students envision a limitless path, not just graduates. I had never really thought about it the way that Mia presented it, which I like the idea of seeing, like I think it's possible that in three years you would see the eighth graders respond to the survey and then they would be in the next year they would be ninth graders and the next year they would be 10th graders and that you would see them getting closer to imagining their future and i think that could be interesting data to have um the friend that i consulted 
all said the same thing about self-reporting data and that it tends to lean towards a rosier view of things. So it's not considered a very reliable measure. But I still think when you, like Libby said, there's four measures here listed. There's four indicators. What's that? And maybe a fifth. And maybe a fifth. But, um, well, and, and even in one and two, we're saying state and local assessments. And local assessments, I, I don't know how many you're planning to use, but there are a few. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's, there's, there are multiple, you know, ways to measure listed in these four. So I think just in the spirit of moving forward, I feel comfortable 8 through 12. Um, and I also feel comfortable keeping the language our graduates because like, like Libby said, like maybe they can't picture it as a third grader. <laughs> I think that's not developmentally appropriate. Or they do. I'm going to be a marine biologist <laughs> right. and a professional basketball player. When right, I'm not NBA. Picking <laughs> firm, um, you know, but that, firm. But that like we move them through, you know, the, the process and the school system and eventually they, they it clicks, you know. Um, so... So are you arguing against your suggested change? Nope. I'm still <laughs> going to argue for the suggested change. I'm just, well, yeah, I did, I did suggest grade 11 and 12. And now I'm saying I'm open to 8 through 12 because I think that it does make sense. Like, I think I maybe would be interested to see how they, I think that could help us, you know, to see how they improve over time in being able to envision their limitless path. But I'm not changing the, the word. Another thing I know that this community values is student voice. And I don't know how to get student voice in a way that matters without them self-reporting. Right. It's, yeah. it's tricky. Jill. I, I am very committed to keeping this indicator. How I, I, I totally understand about self-reporting. This was one sort of morphed from one of the ones I had brought from the Career Center because that's, it, and because I think one of the reasons it's also really important is it's not just about closing the academic achievement gap, it also impacts belonging. I mean, there's so yeah. many reasons why, and I, and I just think it would be, so it, is, it has been done, right, because we had data on that at the Career Center. I'm sure there's ways to do it. I know it sounds like a lot of work, but I can't imagine we would put so much effort and energy into pre-K through 12 and then just be like, okay, hope, hope it worked and not at least try to ask like exit interviews when people leave jobs is really informative and i and the YRBS the youth risk behavior survey is a is a statewide survey about like risky behavior and it is also self reporting and i'm sure there's some mushiness but overall it provides a huge amount of really important data so mm -hmm. i i i still feel like we need to try to capture this somehow um for a lot of reasons, and I, I think it'd be a shame if we don't. I know it sounds, I'm, I'm happy to hear, Libby, that you're interested too, because I, I don't have like the survey ready, <laughs> but I love that there's interest in that, and I think I like the eight through 12 too. And I did want to add, while I'm rambling, I did like your addition about establishing a baseline. There's a few of these that we don't have a place yeah. to start from, so mm -hmm. how can we have indicators of yeah, growth we when we don't that. have yeah. a baseline? So I like that too. Yeah, and it might, so like the, the suggested language came from a feeling that you cannot draw a correlation between a student saying, yes, I feel confident in my academic and social emotional success today, this year, and then the bullet point to the left. Um, a limitless future. I can envision a limitless path to my future and chosen pursuits of learning that benefits myself and my community. There's just not a direct correlation there. Um, in my opinion. Um, so that's where the, the suggested language came from. It's about trying to make sure that what we're getting in the survey responses is actually tied to what we want to know about, <laughs> right? And, and I think that we accomplish that if we add what you've suggested, with mm -hmm. a, but not replace what was there. Because I think it's good to know it, it, I think it's good to know both things. And we could maybe finesse the language of number four to mirror the language that I've been recommending for the other ones when we're doing self when we're talking about self-reporting surveys. So, anyway, the the suggested addition now is to establish a baseline and see a pattern of growth across demographics in maybe that's just students, but in 11th and 12th graders reporting high levels of confidence in their postgraduate goals and readiness in a survey supported by research 
that part is very important. Like, how are we developing these questions? Why are we measuring that? Like, are they coming from Panorama, Libby? The survey company? Um, I, I don't know if they have the exact survey questions okay. in there. If, if they are the exact survey questions that we want, if, we have, if they have survey questions, then they are from Harvard. Right. Because the reason I asked is because um, a couple of years ago when the equity committee was <coughs> drafting the climate survey that we send to staff and teachers from scratch, we actually used yeah, panorama a panorama survey. sample survey as one of our okay. jumping off points. Yeah. Right. <coughs> so um, I feel pretty good about it. And designed to measure a variety of factors that influence students' relationship with their post-graduation goals and, and future. So the reason why I worded it that way is because you could read bullet point number four as just a survey with even one question that says, do, are you confident, or rate your confidence in your academic and social emotional success on a scale of one through 10. So I just wanna be, I just wanna be careful with the wording, just, and I don't think anyone would go and do that, probably, <laughs> but um, I just wanna make sure that we're putting in wording that explains closer, that gets us closer to what we actually wanna see so if we're going to keep bullet point number four, I would just want to finesse it with some of that same language. The same language being like supported by research and designed to measure a variety of factors, mm -hmm. that stuff? Yeah. Okay. I think because we have self-reporting in here in a couple of places, because it also shows up in safety, wellness, and belonging, maybe it's another thing that we add to the bottom it's, we're going to go from asterisk to double asterisk to footnote number one to, <laughs> to I don't know. Yeah, little, little crosses. We'll need the, yeah, we'll the, need the, the like the, carrot. The, it, the, we'll get there. Yeah. We'll, yeah, I think that that will be, that's a good explain, like explainer for methodology. And the other thing is that establishing a baseline and seeing a pattern of growth where we don't, unless Libby has some suggestions or already there's some research out there either in our district or in Vermont or nationwide data that we can say, you know, right now the projected baseline would be maybe 50% of kids report right. this, then we probably shouldn't put a specific percentage point in there. But also just to stay students in grades eight through 12 self-report confidence feels like, well, what is the measure there? Is it five students? Is it 10% of our students? But we also have that we will use this school year to establish a baseline. Yeah, so I guess it's just, yeah, and see a pattern of growth. Uh -huh. That's what I would recommend. I would recommend, okay. at, instead of having it in parentheses after, I would recommend putting this part in the front of bullet point number four if we're gonna keep that one. Um, we don't usually take during the, but, huh? Yeah, no, sorry. Um, I know it's not a huge deal with, with small people in here, but um, I want to want to be fair to our protocol. Um, okay. Do do we want to move on to belonging safety and wellness? Are we, yeah, are I we settled? think we can. Yeah, you could probably connect with one of us after. Yeah, like yeah. Jim after. You could, yeah, you could send, you know, if send, send us an email, and I'll I'll take a look at it. How about that? So this um, suggested language you have here, Emma, establish a baseline and see a pattern of growth across demographics when surveying students and staff using, so that is to replace the first one that's in here under. Are we moving on to the next? We're moving to safety, belonging, and wellness. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, let me just get yeah. to the notes, sorry. Okay, well, I have, I have one other suggestion. I just wanna like cede time to other people if you have anything that you wanna say before I delve into my <laughs> suggestions. Like, I just feel like I'm talking a lot. You can't ever give yourself a hard time about not being prepared or dedicated time <laughs> like you started off. <laughs> only two more green paragraphs. Okay. I think the floor is yours, Emma. Okay. Um, so 
First, I'm not, I, I don't love the goal, the language of the goal. Every person will have a sense of belonging, safety, and wellness. It feels a little uh, too broad. I would recommend saying maybe, and I know where this is sort of moving backwards and I apologize for that, but um, Montpelier Roxbury's uh, public schools will prioritize the belonging, safety, and wellness of our students and staff. Every person, maybe um, if you want to, I just think every person is too broad. What does that mean? So. But if it doesn't say every person, does that mean only most people? I'm not recommending to, what do you, I'm sorry, I'm not following I mean, I just, the point you're I, making. I think the, I think the, I thought that every person will have a sense of belonging, safety, and wellness was meant to be really what our goal is, which is maybe really, really, really difficult to achieve, but certainly the aspiration that we're shooting for, I, I know that it's like very, very. Every member of our, every person in our school community. <clears throat> yeah. I, mean, I, like I, mean, I, that, I like that better than we prioritize safety, belonging, and wellness, because we prioritizing yeah. it isn't the end goal we want. Okay. We want the impact. Yeah. I mean, could it be like every person in our district community? I mean. I kind of think there's an assumption that we're not talking about people like Halifax, Nova Scotia, but. Um. Yep. And, our, you know, a sense of, to me, I'm hoping that even folks who don't have a direct connection with the school district will feel connect, you know, like that they do have a sense of belonging with the school district. And so that every person to me goes outside of just people that have kids in the schools or people that have had kids in the school in the past to the folks that, um, you know, maybe they'll never have kids in the schools, but they still feel like the schools are a welcoming place for them. Yeah, I think if you even go to, you know, people from outside the community who might attend events here or, um, you know, other people who are, to come to our district in some sort of contact. I feel fine with the change as it's been made. Just adding in our school community. Mm -hmm. That feels better. Okay. Um, it Great. given given. Are you done with that? <laughs> now it's my turn. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, given given that and the objective, so um, all th certainly the first two objectives are the entire community, but. The only indicator that refers to staff is the first indicator, and I think maybe one of your suggested changes um, gets to that. But but I Ooh, could I put a chronically absent goal yes. for staff members? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. I kind of think my union would have some challenges <laughs> to that. However, well, it's intriguing. <laughs> um, so maybe not the the chronically absent uh, one, but certainly the third one um, could pertain to to staff as well as students. Uh, I guess not, not the, MTSS. the MTSS. Yeah, so I don't know how to address that, but I do think it's important to, that we're, we're, our indicators include measures of staff and students yeah. and administrators. I think Emma's suggestion, final suggestion in her emails speaks to that, what you just said, Scott. So I just drafted into the document uh -huh. Regular reporting on our SEL systems and initiatives for both staff and students, which I think what you mean there, Emma, is MTS would be Just one students. of the things, but not all of what would be reported on. Is that right? Am I reading that right, Emma? Um, sorry, you're switching to the, you're, we're now talking about the MTSS one? We're talking about number three. Yep, number three. Expected indicators. So I actually am not sure that, um, MTSS, I, I, so I recommended, where is it? I think, I think we can just take out that language that's in black because I just picture more of an overview of social emotional learning systems and initiatives in the district for both students and staff. And if that includes MTSS, that can be included in that report. Right, that's what I was asking. Yeah, so I think we can just take 
I, I think we can strike the black. Can so you give me an example of an SEL system that is not part of our MTSS model? Uh, restorative practices. Totally part of our MTSS model. And Hazeman harassment and bullying policy and procedure. That's a policy and procedure, so it's not a system, right? So um, that would be just a procedure, but like restorative practices is, is most definitely a tier one, two, and three strategy in terms of working through challenges the community has together. So everything we do works through our MTSS model. Um, my other um, intriguing piece of this would be how do we show SEL systems for staff? Well, what would that, what would an example well, of that do, be? I don't know, like you did a lot of work, I was thinking that you did a lot of work with Joelle Van Lint, Lent in professional development and I would figure that some of that would touch on some well-being for staff, but I'm not sure. It I, did, particularly coming out of, co it was very targeted towards coming mm -hmm. out of COVID. Um, I wouldn't call that a system either. I'm so open I'm, to changing the language from system. I'm open to changing. I changing just want to make word. sure that I'd be clear about yeah. what, what I'd be reporting on because I'm not right now as, a, as that's written. I'm not sh the only thing I could think of is talk space, which will most likely not be part of our budget in the future. Mm -hmm. um, because the state is kind of taking that over. So that's the only kind of or use of like the employee health like I don't I don't know what that yeah. would be yeah. that truly raises to the level of mattering I'm well, totally open to changing the language based on what you think makes sense based on what you just said Libby it seems like staff benefit from the MTSS system when it comes to SEL you know like staff certainly benefit from a growth of restorative practices in the classroom and in the mm -hmm. school so it's almost as if if you are reporting on MTSS, we're hearing. See, I was I was really picturing like I mean whatever. I've been a teacher. Jake's been a teacher. You've been a teacher. Like what? Where is my sense of as a teacher? Where is their sense of belonging, safety, and wellness? Where is that being addressed? How are we addressing Isn't and making that sure? The first one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. And but so I just I just would say that I would want another so in the other ones in the other goal that we just worked on there was four different measures that sort of touched on it and I don't see why we wouldn't have the administrators report out on what they do to ensure that their staff like in a more qualitative way what initiatives they have in place to ensure that their staff has a sense of belonging safety and wellness and I don't know what those things are to be able to say them to you but I would imagine because I know a lot of teachers feel a really strong sense of belonging, safety, and wellness as employees of this district. And I think it would be interesting to like report out on that. <clears throat> so the wording seems to be the issue and not calling it SEL. I'm not sure how we collect data other than a survey. Qualitative reporting from like we've always had from like Nick Connor, from Julie, from Katie and they come in and they say, here are some of the things that we've done as a community to bring uh, com the community together of our staff. You know, we've done the staff appreciation breakfast or I, I mean, you can fill in the blanks on the types of things that you guys do as a district to ensure that people feel connected. Does this feel like something that, so if we have the one that's the self-reporting from students and staff, we have number one set we have the chronically absent. I'm curious f from other members of the board if there's something else. Like Emma's saying, here's another thing that as a board member I would like to see to help make sure we're, these measures of these ex indicators are being used to measure progress on our objectives. Is, that, is this resonating with other board members? I don't want to lose the MTSS SEL piece. So whether it's adding another one or what, but I don't think we want to lose that was that's like a key foundation to that the environment system resources and opportunities foster that success and our presence. So I don't want to lose number three. Uh huh. And I was picturing stone of our work. Our yeah, I was picturing MTSS being in this. So like you, I just don't know if maybe I just have a. a problem with the terminology that I'm using, but 
multi-tiered systems of support, you know, like when I think about what Jess and Nick do, I don't necessarily connect them to MTSS. Oh my gosh. Jess runs our, S our like Jess is the, yeah, that, then that's a, that's a misconnect because right. Jess runs the SEL MTSS model. Like so is the same. SEL MTSS separate from like academic MTSS? It's the same model. It's just looking at different skills and development. Okay. But it's the exact same model. Um, and the boards put a lot of budgetary pieces into our MTSS model in terms of human capacity building, particularly last school year. Yeah. In order to make that model work. And we're having, a, we talked about it just today, we're having a significant level of success there. So that model like when we talk about our four pillars that is our mtss model and it's both academics and sel they're not mm -hmm. while well, they're two separate things and but they're it's the same theory behind the um systems of support so i if we just added mtss back into the language that emma suggested because i think one of the things that emma's language gets at is the by adding in this initiatives is more of that like community building stuff that happens i don't want to just say like on the margins because it's definitely more important than that but is you know things like and i know that the the Caregivers Alliance does this in the middle school, but it's the only thing that's coming to me right now, but like Popcorn Fridays would be, I think, an example of something that's not in the MTSS system, but is an initiative, and there's other things like that. So anyway, yeah. I, think what, I think what I'm reading in what you're saying here, Emma, is that in addition to yeah. the like hardcore stuff that we do around social emotional learning, mm -hmm. it, there are other, um, sort of like warm fuzzies that would be good to know and right. what and what impact those warm fuzzies are having. Yeah, I saw it as... I'm getting real technical here. I saw it as a way of broadening the report out and not limiting it to MTSS, that there could be other things. Like, I think if you ask, and, and not that they need to know, but like if you ask Alara and Miriam or my kids or whatever, like what is it that gives you a sense of belonging in school? I don't think anybody's gonna say the multi-tiered system of support, but probably the answers that they would give might be embedded in the multi-tiered system of support. So maybe like Harvest, harvest Day. Harvest Festival is a great harvest example festival. of where, but I don't know, maybe Harvest Festival is part of MTSS. I don't know. And so that's what I'm sort of looking for is, is there a way to sort of broaden it to these more qualitative examples of how we bring our community together and how we infuse belonging and safety and community, uh, you know, for the students. I feel like for me, what helps me feel like I belong here is my extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. and, like the people I meet through that and like, especially with theater, because it's sixth through 12th grade, I have someone I can talk to in every single grade. I have someone in the hall I can say I do all the time and they're just like, we're just like this. <laughs> That's what we are. So I don't know how like extracurriculars and stuff fits into that, but I also think that's such a big part of why people come to school is so that mm, they can be eligible to play their sport or go to rehearsal afterwards. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I'm looking at it more quantitatively because like for me to be even broader about it, the thing that makes me feel like I belong here is the connections that I have here. So that's with my teachers, with my TA, with my friends, with my teammates. But that's not as measurable. I mean, you mm -hmm. can ask me how many meaningful connections I have. I probably can't give you a number. Yeah. How many friends do you have, Miriam? You have although, right now. although the TA model is a place where MTS, MTSS work happens, you just might not know that it's called that. Yeah. Yeah. So there are, like, there are those things which are, yeah, they're, they're secretly part of MTSS. <laughs> we don't know that, but they are. Um, well, I know that now because I met with yeah. SEL. But, um, you had a whole meeting with Jess Murray. It was great. She's lovely. I know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's just good to look at it, not just as numbers, because the, the things that can be measured might not be, to me, what is most important in my school experience or might not seem to me like what's most important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I think the, the biggest challenge that I, or the bigger hurdle I'm trying to get over in my head is the staff piece. It's not the students piece, it's the staff piece. Um, does, does the does the board want us to report out on the number of staff breakfasts we have in the dodgeball tournament that we might do? Or, you know, like, is that, is that stuff the board really wants to spend time talking about? I Not think that's what I'm trying. I'm, it's yeah, a genuine Scott, I think question. Scott has an answer to response I mean, to Luke's then, question. Then our goal should not be every person in our school community has a sense of belonging, safety, and wellness, right? If that if we're really saying every person and three of the four indicators don't include all of the people, that's the question I have: is how do we how do we make our expected indicators inclusive of all of the people mentioned in the goal? I feel compelled to remind us all that we are the ones who wrote all these, yeah. not yes. Libby. And I feel like this is turning into like a asking Libby how to like answer these magical questions that we've created. I I don't have a problem with some of the indicators being specific to students. I think we would lose a lot of valuable information. And I think the single biggest indicator I think that would at least give us a baseline, and again, it doesn't mean we can't change our indicators going forward, would be this first indicator for both right. staff and students. I do think we get regular updates on um, on a lot of other, I love that we hear about the professional development, things like that, so I wouldn't want to not hear that, but I don't think we have to spell that out here. I do think that you folks have raised that, I think, I think the objective is captured, the environment, system, resources, and opportunities foster student and staff wellness and success are present and thriving in our schools. Like, so I'm thinking of theater, I'm thinking of track, I'm thinking of those yeah. things in that we, and I don't know that it would be that valuable for like, we do get a report out separately about like participation in those things. So maybe we don't need it to be an indicator here either. But I just, I just want to, I just want to caution us that like, if we don't think that there's a way to measure what we've asked and our objective, then we need to change our objective. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's, yeah, I mean, our, our primary focus is the schools is students and the kids. So I think it's okay to be heavy on indicators that focus on students and the kids. Mm -hmm. And they also have less of a say whether they're here than a lot of the adults. I mean, I think they're, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, I think we wanna measure that, but I, I think if we get a, you know, if you get a sense that we have a lot of, a lot of teachers and staff exiting and other things, then you yeah. know, those, are, sure. those are indicators that they're not feeling great. Mm -hmm. Could be. Could be. I also think it's fair to think that a lot of the initiatives that are for students are also for our staff. Yes. Like the Harvest Celebration. Yeah. It, I imagine, I haven't attended it, but I imagine that teachers also think it's pretty cool and it also, so anyway, I, I think we might be in danger of overthinking this yes. a little bit tonight <laughs> at 827 and the way that we've got it worded here where we get regular reporting on social emotional learning multi-tiered systems of support and the initiatives for our full school community inclusive of staff and students that shows the impact that any of our any of these things have is essentially the board just saying like tell us what you're doing and if it's working yeah yeah. And I am interested in staff wellness. Like, I think that they are our number one human re you know, resource. And I think that they predict a lot of feelings of safety and belonging in students, too, because a lot of what kids talk about is having that trusted adult in the building and the teacher that. So, like, the retention and happiness and wellness and belonging of those people is yeah. very important. And my prediction would be that we already are doing a lot of that stuff. So, it's just a matter. I don't, I don't think we need to get in the weeds of like, I know you you love to dot your I's and cross your T's, but I feel like it can be like a once a year qualitative sort of like, here are some of those things that we're doing and here's why we think that they're effective. And, and to Jill's point, if, if our objective, if, if we are not going to measure an indicator, or not going to um, look at an indicator that actually measures our objective, then we should change our objective and be, be clear that students are our priority. So we don't care, not sorry, we don't care, but families are in here and there's no measure in any of our indicators of family. And so that family- It was, it got taken out. Okay, so 
again, like we, we, I think we just need to be clear, this is our objective, and then this is how we're gonna measure whether or not we're, we're meeting it. And right now, I don't feel like our indicators are lined up with well with our objectives as written. Yeah, no, I, I think that's I think that's definitely fair. Um, I, I, mean, I, 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 d I disagree. I, I, I mean, I just added families back in because yeah. we accidentally took it out. And so right now, three of the four, the way they're written, do speak to staff. Because on the fourth one, we're asking this, the administration to report back to us on what they did to bring the community together. They would not dis discount staff out of that. And they would probably not discount families out of that. So right now, f two of the four include families. And three of the four include our staff. And all of the four include our students. So I think we're actually in pretty darn good shape. Yeah. And... I mean, I, I think it's, I think these are all related. I think with, you know, I think if you're measuring most groups, kind of most of your community, I think if you've got like a, a belonging environment or, or you kind of don't. Um, and I don't think we want to be exclusive of anyone. Uh, but I also think that if, if we're hammering it in all of these four categories, it's probably in part because we have happy staff who are also feeling that they belong here and we've got a good environment. And, I mean, because you know, the staff and the teachers are so integral to how the students are reacting, how the students are doing. And if, if they're feeling miserable, the students are probably <coughs> not going to be doing great. I also remind the board that by contract, you send a climate survey every year. Yeah. So that would get us the data for number the, one. Exactly. So that would. Yeah, I like that. So what about families? Fam we're developing a pa the panorama survey for families now. We're just nice. waiting. We're yeah. in discussion about what time is the best time uh -huh. to send it home. We ha so, so we would need to establish a baseline for students and families because we haven't done that so far. But we actually have a pretty good baseline from the last couple of years mm -hmm. on staff. And so we have a way to collect data on that first one. But I thought what I was hearing you say before is that right now there's not really a good way to to report on staff for <coughs> the third one. I'm Unless just not, not completely positive as to what yeah. I would report out on. Mm -hmm. I can make some. <laughs> <laughs> we can yes. try it. We yeah, can try we, it. We can flesh yeah. it out yeah. later. There's kind of a, a mathy thing happening with a lot of these where Ooh, like it's unclear to me, are we saying all students, staff and families, which would be 100% in my head, or are we saying that we need we have a baseline that we establish and we want it to be improving? Because mm -hmm. I are think it's the latter. The first one says see a pattern of growth. We haven't defined what that pattern of growth is. Is it two percent? Is it five percent? Right, but I'm looking at the objectives. It says all students, staff, and families. Right, so that's a hundred percent. So then our goal, our indicator would be some survey where we get answers back that says a hundred percent. Right. But right, but right now we might be at 50, so then we need to figure out how, how much growth do we want over what period of time. But I'm just, well, I'm just yeah, guessing at 50. The other, the other piece that I up. think you're getting at, Jake, is what we talked about in a previous board meeting, is that when you're talking about a survey that goes to families, for instance, that a good response rate is 30% of that population. Okay, well... Um, Right, so you're not going to get information. I don't think we'd ever get information from every person in our MRPS community. Then, then we would stick in the words of survey respondents. But we could get rid of the word all in the first bullet um, if, we're, if we're, unless we're really going for that. I mean, I think we leave it as an objective, and it is certainly aspirational. And then it's our measure of progress where we get the actual numbers. The numbers we just don't know right now because we haven't done a baseline. We haven't gotten a baseline for students and families. We did agree at some point along this process that it was okay for that language to be aspirational. Okay. And that it was more about the indicators like for the next, this is just, this is being written for just this year, next school year, and the school year following. The right hand column. So it's only for three school years. 
including the one that we're almost halfway through. Um, well, one quarter of the way yeah, through. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. Right? Yeah. Time moves fast enough, except when you're in a board meeting. Point being, like the indicators could change again, like later. Hours. We could even re revise them next year if we get some a data point back that shows us that we have to. Okay, I mean that. So that's helpful background. Yeah. Um, because then I can shift out of my like overly statistical brain and, yeah. and see where you guys are going. No, right. No, stay there. Yeah. <laughs> so that's helpful in the next one too. Yeah. Um, I don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but originally when I had recommended that the uh, language that is now bullet point number three, um, it was meant to replace two and three because I was feeling like uh, attendance data, we couldn't really directly correlate it to the objectives that are listed to the left. And that we track it and we're doing such good work there already. It's not something that we would really be adding. Um, and it can be reported out under bullet point number three, um, but that it doesn't necessarily have to be listed. So that's Attendance it. is a part of MTSS? It could be, yeah. Um, the, that is a goal that the leadership team as a whole feels very strongly about that I can say confidently. Okay. I'm happy to. Attendance? Yeah. The goal Chronically one. absent. Chronic yeah. Number two. I feel good about that goal too. I just don't know if I feel that it is correlated to the bullet points, but I'm okay just letting it stay. Sit with Nick Connor. He'll convince <laughs> you in about five minutes. Okay. Okay. Are there other, we're still on safety, belonging, and wellness. Stay with me for a minute here, people. Any other thoughts, comments, suggested changes for safety, belonging, and wellness? Okay. I'm going to propose that we pause the process here. Because we don't accepted. because we don't have <laughs> second I mean, language <laughs> yet, I don't think on community engagement. Is that right? Yes. We don't have that yet. Yeah. So yeah. rather than move into that one tonight, I propose we pause here and move on to uh, policy monitoring. Yes, I think that's a fantastic think, proposal. Seeing Meat Loaf who said it well, two out of three in bed. Two out of three in bed. <laughs> yeah. And we're not done. We're really nice. making reference. Good progress. <laughs> <sighs> um, so policy monitoring, we have three policy monitoring reports for approval, um, A23, Community Engagement and Vision, C6, Participation of Home Study Students, and D1, Proficiency-Based Graduate Requirements. Um, do I have a motion to approve those three policy monitoring reports? I move to approve those three policy monitoring reports. Do I have a second? Second, um, and I have a question. I was just gonna ask any <laughs> discussion or question. Um, Go for it, Scott. The, in the process the, of doing the monitoring reports, the, so I'm looking at the first one, the bold paragraph at the top, Libby, it says MRPS school board will work, da 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 da. Um, that is not from our policy, but your but you're oh, wording. It's an interpretation of the policy. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. just meant to be an yep. interpretation piece. Fantastic. So I know we talked about this a little bit the last board meeting. I I interpret it differently. If you go to our policy, um let's see. Where was I looking? It's linked in the agenda. Yeah. I've you're, got like you're 17 on it. windows. You have it open. <laughs> um, so, it's, so we say the board will develop an articulated vision, which we're in the process of doing, and will got, adopt goals to move the district forward towards implementation of that vision. And so I, I see our policy including not just the engagement of the board, but the engagement of the district. And it looks like your policy monitoring was solely focused on the engagement of the board. Um, I think my, I can see what you're saying. Uh -huh. I, I think from um, 
to clarify why I went there is talking about the accountability measures. Is the board keeping the, the district accountable towards different things, if I'm reading this mm -hmm. right now, right? So that's why I, I believe I put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're ensuring an organizational structure which allows for attainment of your vision of excellence, then you're ensuring that of us, right? Of the mm -hmm. administration in the district. So then if you go down to your evidence, it's all board, right? It's true. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so, so I, I love the evidence of the board and I, I, w I think it would be nice to also see evidence of the rest of the district in our monitoring of the policy. Good feedback. Yeah, no, I definitely good feedback. Emma. Um, so this is a fairly recent policy, and I was on the committee when we were writing it, and definitely the intent as we were writing it was to ensure that this was more of a holistic engagement policy and not just how does the board engage um, the community. So I, I know that um, Amanda Garces wrote the section receiving community input. You'll see that a lot of the paragraphs start with the board will, the board will. Um, but the, that fourth paragraph there um, says the MRPS school district will use multiple methods to solic solicit feedback from parents and other community members and will take into account language accessibilities, different ways of engaging. Um, in-person online input, provide opportunities for community input and engage with a diverse and neurodiverse population. And also just like the vision, the statement of intent at the top, the first paragraph. So I would um, like to, if, if you're willing, Libby, I mean, I see that you're, you report nearing compliance anyway, so maybe it's a moot point a little bit, but, um, but I wonder if you might be willing to to withdraw it for tonight and put in a, a section under evidence um, and also maybe relook at your interpretation so that it could include, you know, you, you say that you interpret this to mean that the board intentionally seeks out. So maybe if we could say the district and board intentionally seeks out and then include a bullet point about what the district does to engage community. And then it also made me think like, well, if if the intent of the policy committee was different from how you're reading it, um, that maybe we need to look at rewriting it. No, I'd say just what you said. It's the first time it's monitored. This is excellent yeah. feedback, and to take into consideration, I would say the next time it's monitored, you know, mm -hmm. um, because it is a very different policy than what we had previously. So yeah. um, I, I can certainly rewrite it if the board wishes me to do that, or I can take that feedback and take it into consideration for next time it gets monitored, since it gets monitored every every year. Yeah. Jill had a, that's right. Jill? Yeah, I think when you look at the policy and then if you look at the VSBA one as well, I mean, I, I've always understood that district and board are interchangeable. We are the MRPS school district, and so I, I don't have that level of concern. Um, I think, like I said, it, it, they're used interchangeably in the policy and in the VSBA policy. Um, and I, I think we need to be careful about district versus administration versus board. If it's the district overall, I think we can, I mean, if it's just a matter of the semantics of changing district, that's pretty straightforward. But I do think a lot of like legislation and policies say district and that's on us. Like the board is the MRPS district when it comes to But I think when you, I think when you say, I think if you specifically say the board, there's kind of an implication that you're really calling out the board specifically, whereas as opposed to something district wide. I mean, like if we say like the district should have good communication, I think it's it's very clear that you know that Libby should have communication, the teacher should have communication. I think if you say the board shall, then it seems a little more that you're talking about the board, this even group, though yes, sitting even I, though, I do think that feedback is really good. I think yeah. I think I I missed that piece of that paragraph when I was monitoring it, yeah. right? So um, I think that's really good feedback, and I, I, Jill, I, you're 100% yeah. correct, right? And the way that my monitoring report is written, I totally understand what Emma and Scott yeah. are saying, and, and that, that can be done differently and should be the next time. 
So the question would be: Is the board does the board want me to re-monitor, <laughs> if that's a word, this policy, <laughs> word. or do you want me to take that feedback for when it's when it comes mm -hmm. up again, which it will next fall? I vote you just take that feedback for next time. Personally. I vote to re-monitor just to make it part of public record because we never know when Libby is going to leave us to go work for FEMA. <laughs> or would or or escape how, how, how about never? <laughs> <laughs> yes, never. So or win the lottery, yeah, as you mentioned. You yes. might win the lottery and go on like a year-long cruise. When I decide like, to buy it. And so <laughs> does, does the next superintendent look at this monitoring report as a jumping off point for their interpretation? And so I would rather have like the record be more reflective of this can, can we conversation. So can we approve it with the idea that you will amend? Amend. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've done that before. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Okay. I, I have a question before we stop. Um, how far is the monitoring of this policy from the Title One policy? Title like One. Like the E One Title One Parent and Family Engagement Policy that is so extensively about Title One schools and all of the engagement at different levels that um, we looked at wow. when I was on the policy committee. Are they, would the, <clears throat> would you, would you, would you think of the, your evidence for either of these two policies as overlapping? Or would that um, change I, the way I you thought about uh, the I don't want to, the Title I parent involvement. Um, that one is not monitored until April on the schedule. And I don't want to give you a definitive answer, Rhett, because I don't have that policy memorized. Right, being that it's a new policy. Yeah, so it, I, was, it went from this to. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that conversation. I just, I don't want to give you a wrong answer. No, okay. Just because I don't know that one exceptionally well at the, it at the top like of my they, head. It seemed like they <laughs> overlap in a sense quite a bit in that. Probably. Evidence for one overlaps with the well, other. Well, the discussion system. about both those policies in the policy committee overlapped in that neither policy really gets to the like spirit of the type of public comment that we've received around you know the district which is inclusive of the board not necessarily being uh, engaging the community in the way that the community wants to be engaged and so like in our conversations in the policy committee that po the title one policy is so linked to law around title one yeah. that we didn't feel confident like putting what we would want to put in there about the way that laymen would think about parent engagement because it really is linked to parent law. engagement around Title I and it only requires us to engage those parents and those families. And same with this, like this is sort of written about the visioning process and the goals when really we wanted to be more holistic about engaging the community on all sorts of levels and just knocking that out of the park. So right now where we've landed is that we could approve it with the request slash directive to have it amended. Yep. So amended. <laughs> or I move to um, do what you just said. <laughs> no, no, I think that's why I, I think I made the motion, didn't I? I, I accept that as a friendly amendment. Then I'll, I'll second. I think I got the second on that, right? Okay. So. I, I think we're... <laughs> I think we're in good shape. I, I think we're procedurally close. <laughs> <laughs> Locked in. That's where I ate. I had just a couple of questions with the, on the homeschooled students one. Yeah. yeah. How does it work for say like it says that they that homeschooled students have access to like education within our schools is how I was reading that. Like does a student show up in the classroom and say I'm here for the literacy lesson and then um, leave? Well, we know, right? So they don't just show up. No, I know. <laughs> I, I know. We know. Um, yeah, so a parent context. You know they're coming. A parent context, the principal, or caregiver context, the principal, we know what they're signed up for, and they come and then they leave. Huh. Same thing with sports, right? Like they can. Yes. Yeah? Cool. And then my other questions were on the graduation, uh, the proficiency based graduation policy, which was it looks like in the policy we keep referring to proficiency based graduation requirements that are described in the policy but I don't see them in the policy. So is it, this might just be a, a, like feedback from the policy committee. It's not so much on the monitoring report. And I know this is an old one. So it just, it looks, it, I, I couldn't tell 
where proficiency-based graduation requirements were laid out in the policy, but we keep referring to them as in the policy. I think what it's referring to is the first sentence on the second paragraph, the Montpelier-Roxbury School District will use proficiency-based credits for the purpose of demonstrating that a student has met graduation requirements. Like that paragraph okay. describes the meaning behind Proficiency based. like how we're using proficiency okay. based and so that's how I would interpret that okay um, because it's it's the board's prerogative to approve our our proficient like it's the board's written in the EQS the board is responsible for proficiency based ensuring proficiency based grading right right, right. Okay. Um, <coughs> so that's how I would re I would say the second paragraph um, is is what they're referring to okay. and then our handbooks and things and curricular website make it more targeted and specific right where where someone could go and say what are the standards for graduation they can find right. that on our, I did that deep dive you can like you can get there yeah but okay okay yeah I'm not sure we'd have that level of detail on a policy God, I hope no that. no yeah. I don't I think that's not what I was looking at, but it, it, I'm just saying it, it was confusing to read. The policy was a little confusing to read, where it kept like self-referencing itself, and I couldn't tell what we were yes. referencing. Yeah. But that is helpful. Thank yeah. you, Libby. Other, other questions, comments, pontifications? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? S second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you all. Good Thanks, progress. Kristen. Yes. Thanks, Thanks Kristen. for hanging in there staring at the screen. <laughs>